so good to see you all here today, whether it's your first time or you've been here since we launched the church almost two years ago, or maybe you're tuning in online. I hope that you come here expecting to hear from God each week. That's one of my big prayers throughout the week is that, that all of us would just have an anticipation and expectation that God is going to speak to us, whether it's through the music, whether it's through his word. I hope you come with that expectation because as we do, as we anticipate him or, or even just attune ourselves to his voice, I believe that's when we really get access to him, his love, his mercy, his grace, his forgiveness, his comfort, his peace. As we are attentive to how he's moving and how he's speaking in every situation, then that's when we can kind of get right next to him and have him guide our steps. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Jason. I'm the pastor here at the church, and I would welcome the opportunity to get to know you. Usually I hang out down in the front after the service and would welcome any questions that you have. More importantly, pray for you or serve you in any way that I can. So we're coming to the end of our sermon series entitled Scandalous Grace, and we're looking through the Old Testament book of Judges. The book of Judges contains some of the most disturbing, scandalous, crazy stories that you will read in the entire Bible. We focus in on the people of Israel, God's chosen people, the ones whom God delivered out of Egypt, the ones whom he split the Red Sea so that they could cross on dry land. We're focusing in on the Israelites and how they continue to fall despite who their God is. They continue to fall in this cycle of sin, this disbelief and disobedience leading to desertion of God altogether find themselves in some sort of a disaster. God raises up a judge to deliver them. And when that judge dies, they fall harder and farther than they did before. Today, we're going to look at a familiar character. Uh, maybe you heard growing up in Sunday school. We look at Judges chapter 14 through 16 in the spicy life of Samson. He's quite the character as we get into him and as we'll soon Learn. But before we get into that story, I want to start off by posing this question. It's a question that actually came across something totally unrelated to, to my study of Samson, but one that actually really relates to Samson and, and who we are today. And the question is this. What do you do when your eyes see what your body wants that your heart knows is wrong? What do you do? When your eyes see what your, your body wants, what your, your body's craving that your heart knows is wrong, whether or not you're a Christian, you're old enough to know that there has been a time in your life, a, a season in your life, a chapter in your life, perhaps a spring break in your life, a, a, a bachelor party or bachelorette party in your life. There has been some moment in your life when you've had a, a lapse of judgment and you know what it means, or you know that question of, of when you see something that your body wants, that your heart knows is wrong. And ultimately, the way we have to answer that question, or the other question that we have to ask, is for whom or what does your heart beat? Who has control of your heart strings? There's a famous quote often attributed to a well-known evangelist, Dwight L. Moody. And the line goes like this, the world has yet to see what God can do with a man fully consecrated to him. Or in other words, the world has yet to see or there's no telling what God can do through a man who is completely sold out to him, whose heart is beating after him. Moody didn't actually come up with that quote. It was actually his friend and revivalist Henry Varley that, that said that to Moody one time. And it was that phrase that launched Moody into this life of fully being devoted after Jesus. And as we look at the life of Samson this morning, there's a supernatural potential within Samson to carry out a God-ordained purpose. But his self-centered pride, his self-centered preferences get in the way of his God-given potential. You see, Samson was an incredibly strong man with a dangerously weak will. And here's the truth about us. We all have a little Samson's inside of us. Each and every one of us. So what do you do when your eyes see what your body wants that your heart knows is wrong? This is a question I want to help answer today as we go through this spicy character. 
As a quick background to, to Samson, last week we focused on Judges chapter 13. We were introduced to Samson's parents, Manoah and his wife. And Manoah and his wife were unable to have children. So one day the angel of the Lord appears to Manoah's wife, says, hey, you are going to bear a son. He is going to be a Nazarite, and he is going to begin to save my people from the hand of the Philistines. Now, to be a Nazarite back in those days was to take a vow which, which signified one's wholeheartedness after God. They, they, they devoted themselves to the purposes and plans of God. But there were three prohibitions that if you were taking this vow that you had to observe. Number one, no alcohol. No Victory Brewing Company, no Levante, no martinis, no margaritas with your Mexican food, no Welch's grape juice. You couldn't drink anything off the vine. Prohibition number one. Prohibition number two. You couldn't touch anything dead. So, so where my mind goes to this is, like, what do you do when you have, like, a gnat or a fly? Like, you can't slap it. I mean, it's dead. I mean, what do you do? I don't know. That's just where my mind goes. Third prohibition, you can't cut your hair. Now, I can say this with absolute 100% certainty that Samson did not have a mullet. There is nothing spiritual, nothing godly, nothing righteous about having a mullet. And if you thought you had a mullet in 18 or 1982 and thought you were cool, you were not. There is special grace and forgiveness for you. <laughs> anyway, Samson, from the time he was in his mother's womb, he was set apart. He was consecrated for God's purposes and plan. Things were going well when you get to the end of, of chapter 13. Listen to what it says at the end of, of this chapter. And the woman, Manoah's wife, bore a son and called his name Samson. And the young man grew, and the Lord blessed him. And the spirit of the Lord began to stir in him. Everything is going in the direction that it was meant to go. And Samson's strength is legendary. But so are his weaknesses. There are instances in Samson's life in which God's strength rushes upon him and he is able to kill 1,000 Philistines. 1,000 people on his own. He's able to carry a city gate on his shoulders. He's able to rip apart a lion with his bare hands. He shows incredible feats of strength, but his self-centered pride gets in the way of his God-ordained potential. I see little Samsons and men all the time. We kind of focused a little bit on the women last week. I'm going to kind of punch us men in the, in the gut a little bit this week. Because of what Samson does and how he lives his life, it just, it just relates. But let me say this as well for, for you women out there. Even though I might focus in a little bit on the men, Samson's life is really just a microcosm of Israel. And so everybody is, is, can learn and apply the things that Samson did to their own lives and, and make themselves better for it. I know of men who, who love God and and love their families, and love their, their, their kids, their wives, but they are trapped in the chains of, of lust or addiction. I know of, of men who are type A personalities. They are go-getters in their careers. They are blazing new trails in corporate America, but when they come home, they remain passive in, in leading their wives. They remain passive in leading their kids. They are committed to being the best business person that they can be. They'll spend hours and hours and hours golfing, fishing, reading through Sports Illustrated, but they won't spend 10 minutes each day in God's word. There is so much God-given potential in each and every one of us. But a lot of times we squander it away to our self-centered pride. And as we look at Samson's life, I want to highlight four attitudes that make strong men weak. Four attitudes, and if you're taking notes today, here are the four attitudes. Lust, entitlement, compromise, and pride. So what is lust? Lust is when, is when a man sees something that his body wants, that his heart knows is wrong, and goes after it anyways. So what does that mean when, when, when somebody lusts after saying? I'm going to give each of these attitudes a little phrase. And so when we think of lust, think of this phrase, I want it. 
Say that with me. I want it. One more time. I want it. That's the, that's the characteristic of, of lust. You see, when a man slips into the attitude of lust, he completely blinds himself to all logic. He sees the girl and says, I want her, even though he's married and can't have her. He sees the car and says, I want it, even though his bank account's in the red and he can't afford it. He sees the, the job, the promotion. He, he puts that, that money on the game for the thrill. He says, I, I want it, even though there, there, there's no logic behind it whatsoever. Could be that boat, could be that, heart, that house, it could be that new gadget. He slips into lust and takes steps towards that lust that defy all logic. Just like a lot of men today. Samson's downfall was women. He lusted after women. Now, there's nothing wrong or sinful for a man to look at a woman and say, hmm, she's pretty, she's cute. But it's when that look turns into lust that it becomes sin. You see, God created men as visual creatures, and, and that's how we're initially attracted to people of the other sex. But when it, when it takes that step into lust, I want her, I want it, that's when it becomes sin. There are three women mentioned in Judges chapter 14 through 16 that highlight Samson's attitude of lust. I've named them simply Philistine number one, woman number one, Philistine woman number two, and Philistine woman number three. We see the first one in Judges chapter 14 verses one through three. Text goes like this, Samson went down to Timnah, and at Timnah he saw, he looked at, one of the smoking hot daughters of the Philistines. That's not in the Hebrew. I just inserted that, but you can see that's probably what happened. Then he came and told his father and mother, and, and I saw one of the daughters of the Philistines at Timnah. Now get her for me as my wife. But his father and mother said, Is there not a woman among the daughters of our relatives or even among our own people that you must go and take a wife from the uncircumcised Philistines? But Samson said to his father, Get her for me for she is right in my eyes. Samson said, I want her. I gotta have her. I'm gonna get her. Now Philistine woman number two. She's found in Judges chapter 16. Samson went to Gaza, and there he saw, he looked at a prostitute, and he went in to her. And then finally, Philistine woman number three, who we're probably most familiar with in Samson's downfall, the one, the only, the famous Delilah. She shows up just three verses later after Philistine woman number two. And after this, he loved a woman in the valley of Sorek whose name was Delilah. Now that word loved is an interesting word. It's actually a word that means she, he was sexually attracted to or lusted after. Women was his downfall. The reason it was wrong for Samson to pursue Philistine women was because God strictly prohibited this when, when his people entered into the promised land. Now, it wasn't because God was racist. It was because God was jealous. God knew that if his people would marry or intermarry other cultures, other religions, then they would adopt their gods and end up worshiping their gods. Lust basically blinded Samson to all logic. God told him no. His parents told him no. All logic told him no. And that's what lust does. It makes strong men weak. It causes self-centered pride, self-centered preferences to get in the way of God-given potential. So lust, I, I want it. The second attitude we see that makes strong men weak is entitlement. Entitlement is when a man sees something that his body wants that his mind says he deserves. And so if lust says, I want it, then entitlement says, I deserve it. Say that with me. I deserve it. When a man slips into the attitude of entitlement, it completely blinds him to all gratitude. So we, we look how God has blessed us, and instead of pausing to give thanks for all of the blessings he's already given to us, we see that thing that we want, and we say, you know what, I deserve that. Samson was consecrated since his conception. He was blessed since his birth. He was strengthened by the Spirit. He had everything afforded to him. 
And yet he thought to himself, I deserve that thing. We see this attitude rear its ugly head over and over in Samson's uh, fall for Philistine number one. He is traveling with his parents to this woman's hometown in order to make wedding arrangements. And so we pick up the story in Judges chapter 14, verse 5. It says, And Samson went down with his father and mother to Timnah, and they came to the vineyards at Timnah. Behold, a young lion came toward him, roaring. Then the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon him, and although he had nothing in his hand, he tore the lion in pieces as one tears a young goat. This is a really big deal. A really big deal. But this is an extraordinary feat of strength that, that to tear apart a lion with your bare hands. Now, I have absolutely no idea what the author means by as one tears a young goat. Like, apparently that was a sporting event. I just don't understand that. Like, what do you mean as one tears a young goat? Nonetheless, he rips this lion apart with his bare hands hands. I visited the Philadelphia uh, Zoo when I was in elementary school. I remember face to face with a lion. The only thing that separated us was this clear black or clear uh, plexiglass. This thing was massive, several hundred pounds, huge canine teeth just dripping in blood. At least that's how my memory uh, remembers. And all of a sudden, I'm sitting here looking at this thing face to face. It lets out an incredible yell, swats at the glass. I jump back 10 feet looking for a new pair of shorts. I am pretty sure, about 85% sure I didn't say a bad word. I'm about 100% sure I thought one. It was terrifying. And when I look at Samson's life, ripping this lion apart, it is an incredible feat of strength to do this with your bare hands. But instead of thanking God, God, thank you for, for giving me the strength to do this, he, he goes into, I deserve more. Listen to what it says in Judges chapter 14, verse 8 and 9. After Samson makes some wedding arrangements, he returns to his fiance and, and listen to what happens. After some days, he returns to take her. And he turned aside... This is where we often get jammed up, guys. We, we turn off the path that we're supposed to be walking. He turned aside to see the carcass of the lion. And behold, there was a swarm of bees in the body of the lion and honey. He scraped it out with his hand and went on eating as he went. For Samson, this is strike number one. He broke one of his Nazarite vows by taking the honey out of a dead lion, touching that dead animal. For some reason, he wanted to walk by this lion just so he could once again remind himself of his incredible moment of strength. It's starting to get to his head. I, and then as he does, he, he sees this honeycomb just dripping with honey and says, I deserve that. And so goes and, and takes what isn't his. I mean, who would be so stupid to forfeit everything that God is doing in your life for a handful of honey. Men are. Every single day. We betray our God who has blessed us for stupid, sinful stuff that we feel that we're entitled to. So if lust is, I want it, and and entitlement is, I deserve it. We move on to the third, the third attitude that makes strong men weak, which is compromise. And compromise basically says, ah, I can handle it. I can handle it. Compromise is when a man sees something that his body wants, that his mind says he can keep under control. I can, I can handle it. Well, after Samson grabs this handful of honey, continues on to his fiancée's place to, to finish up wedding plans and actually get married. And, and this is what happens in Judges chapter 14, verse 10. It says, His father went down to the woman, and Samson prepared a feast there, for so the young men used to do. Now, it's important for us to define some of the words that's in this verse to fully understand what's going on. The first word is the word feast. If you remember from last week, I mentioned to you the word or the idea that the Philistines pioneered this celebration called the Mishta. And the Mishta is really just a week-long drinking fest. The only purpose for this Mishta is to get together, drink, and get drunk. 
This is the same word that's used here in this verse for feast, that, that there was this mishta that occurred. Now, the second word we need to define is this idea of, of young men. This, this word young men comes from the Hebrew word bakor, in which we get our English word bachelor. So what's he doing? He's throwing himself a bachelor party. He's throwing himself an epic kegger. I would suggest to you strike number two. He goes against his second prohibition of drinking anything from the vine, drinking alcohol. He violates his Nazarite vow. Now again, you have this incredible potential inside of you. You have this strength, Samson, that has come upon you. How could you be so stupid to forfeit that? You have this God-given potential for greatness. We do it every single day. Every single day we compromise our character by placing ourselves in situations that we know we shouldn't be in. It's the happy hour after work in which 10 to 15 of our coworkers are together. But then as time goes by and six drinks later, it's just you and the receptionist. And before long, you're talking about how your marriages are on the rocks. And you're putting yourself in these compromising situations. Eventually, your character becomes a casualty to your compromise. But you continue to say to yourself, I can handle it. I can handle it. The final attitude that we get to in Samson's life is one of pride. And if lust says, I want it, if entitlement says, I deserve it, if compromise says, I can handle it, pride says, I got this. I got this. There are two specific instances in Samson's life in which this, this attitude of pride wells up. And it's really pride that just encapsulates the other three attitudes. Samson and the Philistines are trading blows back and forth with one another. Samson loses a bet to the Philistines over some Armani suits. You can read about it on your own in Judges chapter 15. So he goes off and he kills 30 Philistine men takes their clothes, and then gives it to the Philistines that he lost the bet to. Philistines didn't like that Samson had just killed 30 of his men, and so the Philistines kill Philistine woman number one and her father, his wife. Well, they continue to trade more blows. In retaliation, Samson goes into a fit of rage, and we read about Samson's response in Judges chapter 15, verse 8. It says, and he struck them, the Philistines, hip and thigh with a great blow. Basically, that's Hebrew for Samson opened up a can of whoop trash on him. Just put him out. Now, the Philistines respond by terrorizing the town of Judah. Judah wants nothing to do with this little feud that's going on between Samson and the Philistines. So the tribe of Judah, his own people, sends 3,000 men to capture Samson to hand over to the Philistines. He says, or Samson says to, to Judah, hey, if, if you tie me up, are you going to kill me? And Israel or Judah says, no, we're not going to kill you. We're going to let the Philistines do that. And so Samson says, okay, you can tie me up because Samson is planning on going to the Philistines and, and opening up another can of wolf trash. So we read about it here as, as the Judah ties up Samson, hands him over to the Philistines. Then the spear of the Lord rushed upon him. And the ropes that were on his arms became as flax that has caught fire. And his bonds melted his hands. And he found the fresh jawbone of a donkey and put out his hand to take it. And with it, he struck 1,000 men. And Samson said, with the jawbone of a donkey, heaps upon heaps, with the jawbone of the donkey, I have struck 1,000 men. And as soon as he had finished speaking, he threw away the jawbone out of his hand. Now, imagine this with me. That there's a little bit of creative liberty here. But, but Samson says, I got this. I got this. He snapped the ropes like dental floss in a fire. He grabs a jawbone of a donkey, opens up another can of whoop trash on him, kills a thousand men, but then he writes a song about it. What's another word for donkey that we sometimes use? Yeah, there's a little bit of that uneasiness. Am I allowed to say that word, ass? I don't like how the, the English Standard Version uh, translates it. Because in the, in the literal Hebrew, it was more of like this. With the jawbone of an ass, I have made an ass out of the mass. With the jawbone of an ass, I have killed a thousand asses. This pride is starting to well up in Samson's mind. 
And I'm not trying to offend you with using that word, but that's exactly what Samson is doing in writing this song. But then it gets even better. He writes this song, he sings this song, and what he does next, homeboy drops the jawbone like he's dropping the mic. And walks away, full of pride. Samson's God-given potential has turned into self-centered pride. Now, I got this. I got this. And from this point forward in Samson's story, it is all about him. Well, then comes Samson's story with Delilah. And this story shows that Delilah is ultimately Samson's downfall. So we pick it up in Judges chapter 16 says this in verse 4, after this he loved, remember he sexually lusted after a woman in the valley of Sorek whose name was Delilah. And the lords of the Philistines came up to her and said to her, seduce him and see where his great strength lies and by what means we may overpower him, that we may bind him to humble him. And we will each give you 1,100 pieces of silver. So Delilah went to Samson, please tell me where your great strength lies and how you might be bound so that one may subdue you. Now, at this point in the story, if I were Samson, I would think red flags would be going off in my mind. Fireworks, danger, danger, abort mission. But Samson actually responds to Delilah. He says, if they bind me with seven fresh bowstrings that have not been dried, then I shall become like any other man. Samson, why would you want to be like any other? other man I think at the heart of every man is is to be different at the heart of every man is to be great at the heart of every man is to be respected in in some skill or, or field why would you want to be like any other man God has given you a potential a spiritual greatness inside of you but you are squandering it away for your self centered pride so Delilah ties him up with fresh bowstrings as he's asleep. Cries out in the middle of the night, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. Samson snaps the bowstrings, opens up a can on the Philistines. Delilah's response, you were mocking me and told me lies. Tell me how you can be tied up. So Samson replies, uh, if they bind me with new ropes that have not been used, then I shall become weak like any other man. So Delilah ties him up with new rope this time. Cries out in the middle of the night, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. Samson snaps the new rope like dental floss and whoops up on the Philistines. Delilah responds, you are still mocking me and telling me more lies. Tell me how you can be tied up. Again, Samson says, if you weave the seven locks of my head with the web and fasten it tight with the pin, then I shall become weak like any other Man, you can't make this stuff up. Who would be so stupid? And all the men say, we are. We do it each and every day. There's a phrase that says, fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. I don't know what to say about Samson. He gets fooled three and four more times. And I begin to think to myself, Samson, you are flirting with strike number three. This time you're even talking about the hair, dude. So Delilah ties up his hair in the web of a sewing machine. That's really what's going on there in that verse while he's asleep. Cries out in the middle of the night, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. Samson frees himself from the web and whoops up on the Philistines once more. Now at this point in the story, we're all sitting here thinking, really? Really? Samson, really? Ladies, let me let you into a little secret. There's only three things that men need to survive. Food, sex, an occasional pat on the head. Good job, buddy. Good job. Nothing long looks great. Now go over there in the corner. Now, if we had to choose one of those things, let me just say there would be a lot of starving men. And this is where Samson becomes blind to what's happening in this whole story. Let's pick it up in Judges chapter 16, verse 15. And he said to him, Delilah plays the oldest trick in the book. How can you say I love you when your heart is not with me? You have mocked me these three times and you have not told me where your great strength lies. And when she pressed him hard 
with her words day after day after day after day. His soul was vexed to death. Now, I actually like how the New International Version puts this verse. With such nagging, she prodded him day after day after day until he was sick to death of it. Man, I want you to think about this for a moment. Samson, incredibly strong, killed a thousand men on his own, ripped apart a lion, carried a city gate on his shoulders, but he wasn't strong enough to lead a woman. All of this strength, all of this potential, but he wasn't strong enough to lead a woman. We have a lot of strong male leaders here in the church. We have a lot of strong male business leaders, a lot of strong teachers, a lot of, a lot of strong male coaches. And I want you to be strong in those areas. I want you to be the best teacher, the best business leader, the best coach that you can be. But I also want us to be a group of men who lead our families well, who lead them strongly, who point people to God's righteousness and his holiness and his love, his mercy. Samson was an incredibly strong man with a dangerously weak will. And listen to how the story ends up. And he told her, told Delilah all his heart and said to her, a razor has never come upon my head for I have been a Nazarite to God from my mother's womb. Now I wonder if Samson even just pauses here for a minute and remembers what his potential was remembers why God placed him on this earth. But then his pride blinds him. If my head is shaved, then my strength will leave me and I shall become weak and be like any other man. This time I think Delilah knows that, that she's got him. So Samson falls asleep on Delilah's lap. Delilah calls for a barber to cut Samson's hair. She cries out in the middle of the night, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. Growing up, when I was getting a little bit too big for my britches, my mom would always recite this verse to me, Proverbs 16, 18. She can probably do it right now. Pride goes before a fall. To which I would say, mom, that's actually not the right words. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. So even in my response, I was proud. Listen to what it says. Samson, as he is woken from his sleep. The, sin, the Philistines are upon you. He says, he says, I will go out as at other times and shake myself free. But he did not know that the Lord had left him. Strike number three. And this is how Satan makes strong men weak. Lust. I want it. Entitlement. I deserve it. Compromise, I can handle it. Pride, I got this. So what do you do when your eyes see what your body wants that your heart knows is wrong? Every man struggles with these attitudes of lust, entitlement, compromise, and pride. And every strong man becomes weak as Satan finds those footholds in his life. And Satan knows that God has given each man, each person, a supernatural greatness, a, a God-given potential. And if he can wear away at that by, by putting lust and putting entitlement and compromise and pride in this person's life, and Satan has that person exactly where he wants him. There is a spiritual greatness in each and every one of us. But we often squander it. To our self-centered pride. Satan looks for ways to make strong men weak, but our Savior looks for ways to make weak men strong. He is a good father. He is an all-powerful God. He is our Savior. God is with you. God is for you, and God wants to empower you to live up to the God-given potential that he has placed in you. Nobody wants that more than God. He wants that more than us. He wants you to live in the purposes and plans that he has placed you on this earth for. Satan wants to take you out. He wants to 
take you out. But our Savior has come to make weak the strong. He wants you to to not squander your God-given potential. You may be down right now. You may be down. You may be broken. But let me encourage you by saying you are not out. As long as you are still breathing, you have a purpose on this earth. One of the most grace-filled verses in this entire passage of Samson comes out of Judges chapter 16, verse 22. But the hair of his head began to grow again after it had been shaved. If you jump to Hebrews chapter 11, maybe later on this afternoon, Hebrews chapter 11 is referred to as the hall of faith. And there's just list, name after name after name of all these great men of the faith. And when we read about Samson in Judges chapter 14 through 16, there's really nothing good about what he does in his entire story. If you read Hebrews chapter 11, I believe verse 32, the author says, what can we say about men like Jephthah and Samson and Gideon? All of these guys who were broken and busted and messed up, yet God's grace continues to work even in the midst of our most scandalous situations. You may be down, but you are certainly not out. Our Savior wants to make the weak strong. So what do you do? What do you do when you find yourself going down a path that you shouldn't be doing? The simple answer is this, you repent. We make this way too complicated. We're going down a path that we shouldn't be going down. Repent simply means to turn around. And God will be waiting there for us. Arms wide open. Lust. I want it. Instead of saying, I I want it. Maybe our, our attitude should say, I want God. I want you. Entitlement. I deserve it. Maybe we shift that and say, no, I deserve death for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Compromise. I can handle it. Maybe instead it's praying, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. There's God-given potential within each and every one of us, whether you're man or woman there is a god-given potential for spiritual greatness within each and every one of us the same spirit that raised jesus from the dead is the same spirit that lives in you and me is the same spirit that came upon samson to give him incredible strength and i don't know about you but i don't want to be just like any other man i want to live into the plans and promises that god has for me and so i leave you with this thought The Apostle Paul writes, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Satan wants to make strong men weak. Our Savior wants to make weak men strong. Would you stand with me as we pray? Father, help us to be aware, attentive, attuned to how you're moving in our lives. Help us to rest in the truth, in the promise that you are there waiting for us if we would just turn around and surrender ourselves completely to you. Help us to live into the spiritual greatness that you've placed inside each and every one of us for your plans and your purposes, for your glory and the good of all people. In Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen.